We laugh a lot at the Minnesota Twins these days for a variety of reasons. Players failing to reach their potential, lackluster seasons, and of course, their infamous playoff losing streak. But what many people seem to forget is that just about two decades ago, Minnesota put together one of the most awe-inspiring seasons in baseball history. With a roster full of underdog characters and young stars, and a city reeling from nearly losing their team as a whole, the 2002 Twins were a team of destiny, and yet every piece of their memory has become become instantly overshadowed by one word, Moneyball. If you're recalling 2002 baseball, you're either talking about that crazy World Series or you're talking about Moneyball. You know the story by now if you're a baseball fan. An Oakland team with a shoestring budget taking chances on nobody's turned analytical darlings, culminating in a 20 game win streak and the best record in the American League. What you also may remember is that that team didn't go all the way that year. Geez, I wonder what other team got in their way. Let's backtrack for a second. The 2002 Twins were a team that almost didn't even get the chance to come together. The year prior, the owners voted 28 to two in favor of eliminating two major league teams, the Twins and the Expos. The reasoning behind it was simple. The teams, quote, had a long record of failing to generate enough revenues to operate a viable major league franchise. The owners of both of these teams were set to receive $250 million buyouts to let MLB fold their franchises. But how did the Twins find themselves here? Well, the Twins desperately wanted to fund a new stadium to replace the rundown Metrodome, but had no way of securing funding for a potential new home. Since the beginning of the 90s, fans knew that the Metrodome was below quality and needed huge renovations innovations, and for a decade, the Twins were linked to various new cities such as Sacramento, Orlando, and Nashville. Rumors even circulated that Bud Selig, then commissioner of MLB, targeted the Twins specifically because of his family ownership stake in the Milwaukee Brewers, a team next closest to the Twin Cities who could greatly benefit from the dissolution of the Twins as a whole. However, a grievance from the MLBPA and an overruling from the federal court judge preserved the life of the Twins. They were ordered to honor and play out the rest of their deal with the Metrodome, and several years later in 2006, Governor Tim Pawlenty signed a bill that approved funding for a new $522 million ballpark known now as Target Field. But enough labor talk, we've had plenty of that recently. Let's talk about these twins. The magic of the 1991 World Series victory had completely dissipated by 2002. From 93 to 2000, the twins put together zero winning seasons, never amassing more than 78 wins in any of those years. Legends left along the way, like Kirby Puckett, who retired, and Chuck Knobloch, who requested a trade out of Minnesota. But the team took a major step forward in 2001 with an 85 win season and second place finish. There was still work to be done, however. Minnesota was ready for a new era in their city. First year manager Ron Gardenhire was hired for the job. Sophomore catcher AJ Pierzynski was expected to build off a promising rookie campaign. Rookie Michael Kadair was going to get his first serious reps at the big league level. Rule five draft pick Johan Santana was set to enter the starting rotation for the first time in his career. But even with their young core materializing, Minnesota didn't do much in the form of external additions. After all, who's going to sign with a team that may not exist by opening day? If this team was going to succeed, it was going to come from their established pieces stepping up and performing better, specifically in their starting rotation. With just two starters with an ERA under four from the season before, the Twins needed Rick Reed, Brad Radke, Kyle Loesch, and the aforementioned Santana to provide some form of stability. The biggest and most telling note about this 2002 team is that they were the youngest team in MLB by far. Nobody knew exactly what kind of production they were going to get out of these young players. But there was perhaps no better omen to the turn of luck these twins would experience than when Jack Jones blasted the first pitch of the 2002 year into the fountains at Kauffman Stadium. After splitting the first 10 games, Minnesota put together eight wins in their next nine and closed April with a 16 and 11 record and a share of first place in the AL Central. And the main driving force behind their newly potent offense was Torrey Hunter, who was finally taking the next step towards stardom. His nine home runs in April were tied with A-Rod for the American League lead and his 371 batting average ranked second in the American League. But for Hunter, the best was yet to come. On May 2nd, with a 7-6 win over the Rays in walk-off fashion, the Twins gained sole possession of first place for the first time, and aside from just one other day that season, they would control that spot for the remainder of the season. They steadied their April momentum into May with a 15-13 month, placing them at a cumulative record of 31-24. The pitching remained an issue for Minnesota, however, with their 4.43 team ERA ranking in the bottom 10 for teams in MLB. Things would get worse for the rotation before they 
they got any better. Longtime ace Brad Radke would be shelved until August with arm injuries. This was a major blow for an always reliable pitcher who started 28 games or more in every season of his 12-year career except for this one in 2002. This came in addition to 2001 ace Joe Mays hitting the shelf in mid-April. He too wouldn't return until the dog days of August. This did, however, pave the way for Johan Santana. He spent the first two months in AAA and finally got the call to fill in for Radke, and he would remain with the big league ball club for the remainder of the season. He made the most of his first chance in the rotation, accruing the fifth best wins above replacement of any AL starter in June at 1.1 F war. Overall, he'd pitched to a 1.88 ERA in five starts in June, and despite essentially missing the first third of the season, Santana's 137 strikeouts would lead all Twins pitchers by the end of the season. While the rotation floundered about, the bullpen began to flourish. Eddie Guardado, nicknamed Everyday Eddie, took over the closer role from LaTroy Hawkins, whose 2001 implosion likely cost the Twins a division crown. The two excelled in their new roles. In June, the Twins would once again gather 15 wins and head into the All-Star break with a head full of steam. Come the Midsummer Classic, the Twins had a 50-39 and record and a season-high 7.5 game lead in the Central. Thanks to his hot start and flashy plays in center field, Torrey Hunter was admitted to both the All-Star game and the Home Run Derby. Joining him in the former was Everyday Eddie and AJ Pierzynski, who was quickly establishing himself as one of the best catchers in the game. His 320 batting average and 504 slugging percentage at the All-Star break topped all American League catchers, and we'll be hearing more from him soon. Following the Midsummer Classic, the Twins came out firing, winning 15 of their next 19 games to finish the month of July. By the end of the month, they had a 14-game cushion over the second-place White Sox and a strong 65-43 and record. Their 19-7 and record in July was their best of any month that season, and this was because new names were beginning to step up. Young designated hitter David Ortiz struggled mightily in the first half with just four home runs, a 235 batting average, and a 697 OPS. But he exploded in July, clubbing seven doubles and eight home runs in this month alone to go along with 20 RBIs and a 1.234 OPS. Corey Koski, who had been with Minnesota prior, had a very peculiar 2002 season where he excelled and regressed on alternating months. His July would be his best month of the season, just like Big Poppy, with an MLB leading 14 doubles as well as 18 walks and a 1.007 OPS. On the pitching side of things, Eric Milton hurled 35 innings for the injury-depleted staff, accruing a 3.60 ERA and 1.0 F war, sixth best among American League pitchers in July. In the bullpen, Latroy Hawkins was flourishing in his setup role with a 1.17 ERA over 15 in the third innings and more F war than any other American League reliever. If you're looking for this team's downside, it likely comes in the month of August, where they went just 15 and 14 and suffered their worst losing streak of the season at four games. Jock Jones, who was having a remarkably consistent season at the top of the Minnesota lineup, peaked in August with eight home runs, ranking fourth in the American League for that month. Rick Reed tossed six great starts in August to the tune of a 2.16 ERA and 1.4 F war, ranked second best among all AL pitchers in that month. But August is mostly significant for the Twins' first meeting with the Oakland A's, who were in the midst of their record-breaking winning streak. We haven't mentioned them a ton since the beginning of the video, but at this point, the magic was in full swing for the Moneyball fame squad. The A's hosted the Twins and swept them to end their month of August, but in the same week, Oakland would travel back to Minnesota for another set. The Twins would beat the A's just once in their six regular season meetings, but the victory was meaningful. Brad Radke, who returned in August, twirled a shutout, his second complete game of the year, as a 6-0 Twins victory ended the A's win streak at 20 games. But as most people know, this would not be the last time these two would meet for the rest of the season. The Twins closed their final month with a 14-10 record, easily sealing the AL Central and the third seed in the playoffs. This Twins team was undoubtedly a breath of fresh air compared to the last decade of rosters, with Torrey Hunter, David Ortiz, and Jock Jones all clubbing 20-plus home runs with an OPS plus above 120. For Jones, his 11 leadoff home runs was the second highest single season value in American League history, only to Brady Anderson's 12. While AJ Pierzynski only hit six home runs, he chipped in a solid 300 batting average with a 439 slugging and 104 OPS plus to go along with 31 doubles. But Torrey Hunter was undoubtedly the best hitter on the team. In the bullpen, their 3.68 ERA ranked fourth in the American League, led by Everyday Eddie and his 45 saves. All in all, this team had some serious weaponry, but remained an underdog heading into their postseason matchup, and wouldn't you know, it would all culminate in a showdown with those Oakland A's. As for the ALDS, you may not remember this, but things started out pretty disastrously for Minnesota. The Twins looked exactly like a team that hadn't played in the playoffs for a decade, committing three errors in the first two innings of the first game. By the end of the second, the Twins had fallen down 5-1 to one in front of a passionate, roaring Oakland crowd. They had been mired in playoff failure and not reaching potential, much like the moniker we now associate with the Twins. But Corey Koski's third-inning two-run blast breathed life into the Twins 
Twins and made it a ball game once again. Tim Hudson and Brad Radke traded scoreless innings until the sixth, where a solo shot brought the game closer. Soon after, Ted Lilly relieved Hudson and a rally ensued with the Twins scratching two more runs to grab a lead they'd never relinquish. Johan, JC Romero, and Everyday Eddie combined for four shutout innings of relief, sealing a pivotal 7-5 win in game one. But Oakland would come back hard in games two and three, throttling Joe Mays and Rick Reed and winning two consecutive games. The Twins were outscored 15-4 in these two games and faced elimination in front of the Minnesota faithful in game four. After being knotted at two through three innings, Minnesota exploded for a seven-run fourth inning, punctuated by errors and wild pitches on Oakland's side. The Twins grabbed a very much needed 11-2 victory and forced game five back in Oakland. Game five was a pitching masterclass. Radke, given the extra day of rest that Tim Hudson wasn't, held the A's to one run over seven solid innings, and the Twins headed to the ninth inning nursing a thin two to one lead. This is when sophomore standout and newly minted all-star AJ Pierzynski played hero with a massive two run home run to extend the lead. Ortiz added insurance with an RBI double, and the Twins handed Everyday Eddie a five to one lead that looked to finish the A's season. But even when the Twins win, things still can't be made easy. Two outs shy of Advancing, Jermaine Dye breathed life into Oakland with a mammoth three-run homer, bringing the contest to a one-run difference once again. With the tying run on first base and two outs, Eddie squared off against former division rival Ray Durham, and the rest, as we know now, is history. The Twins officially crushed the Moneyball dream and probably advancing to the ALCS and winning their first playoff series since they won the World Series. After a decade of misery and the near death of baseball in Minnesota, the 2002 team might have just saved the sport in the Twin Cities. The the Twins narrowly scratched out a 2-1 victory in the first game of the ALCS against the Angels, but their once indestructible bullpen finally caved, and the prowess of 20-year-old flamethrower Francisco Rodriguez stunted every rally that came the Twins' way. The Angels steamrolled them for four wins in a row, eventually taking things all the way for their first and only World Series win. Following that 2002 season, the Twins went on to win the AL Central five times in the next eight seasons. And while baseball fans love to laugh at the Twins for their 18 consecutive postseason losses, we can't forget how miraculous of a season this 2002 team was. This squad will never be appreciated as much as they should, but without them, the Twins themselves might have fallen into an entirely new identity, just like the Montreal Expos. Even if they didn't win at all, this is arguably the most important Twins team in franchise history.